It's time for this week's episode of the Wrestling Perspective Podcast. I wish I could tell you Lars Fredrickson's here, but I can't. Unfortunately, I'm here with two of the ugliest guys in podcasting now. I mean, wow. Well, I mean, wow. I'll be honest. This is the first time ever I can say I might be the better looking guy out of anyone, anywhere. Uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Paul, I'm making really good friends with a guy that will snap my neck in two seconds. So. <laughs> um, all jokes aside, A still, thank you so much for sitting in and uh, doing this dumb thing with me. Well, yeah, I got to cover for Lars's fucking mishaps because yeah. he, you know, he can't do it because he's in Europe. And you know, let's talk. We're not going to talk about how ugly he is, but we'll hear about that later. I anyway. want to do it while he's here. I want to hurt his yeah. feelings. Nah, he's sensitive. But uh, all jokes aside, we got probably the baddest motherfucker on earth that we've probably had on this podcast, and we've had some tough guys. Uh, he's your friend, so I'm going to let you introduce him. So, uh, welcome, Paul Lazenby. Um, I'd start with professional wrestler, but that is just the small part of his history. Um, Payne Crace, original, I dare say an OG at that. Um, MMA enthusiast and you know, competitor, Canadian strongman. I left that out somewhere. Uh, he's done competitions and career stuntman now. And this is actually how we, beyond just a wrestling connection, had met because we worked on a film together, uh, working on stunts and uh, for a Netflix WWE film. Uh, but Paul Lazenby, world traveled, uh, beloved by many. Um, and Not you. Here we are. Me? No, fuck no. Uh, no. Yeah, I didn't think so. Yeah, no, no. I think that should be for the publicity. You're here for the publicity. <laughs> uh, Paul, well, I'll be honest. The first time I've ever heard of you was during the Gears of War stuff. I like I'm not an mm -hmm. MMA guy, and uh, I'm one of those nerds that I'll play some video games. I'll be like, that's a that's a cool voice, and I'll go Google them or look them up. And that's when you first came on my radar. So thank you for making Gears of War fun for me. Well, thanks. I, I do have to clarify. Um Voice is the only thing I actually didn't do in the finished product. Uh, that was John DiMaggio, who I think has been oh. the voice of Marcus Phoenix for uh, since the beginning of the franchise. But when you're when you're playing Gears Four, you're playing Gears Five, or you're playing Gears Ultimate, all the Marcus Phoenix you see there is me. All the acting, okay. all the stunts, all that. Uh, Nick Barrett did my stunts in Gears Five. I got to fess up to that. But um, all the acting and stunts in Gears Four and Ultimate, um, we did record dialogue with accents because I was also Paddock and Oscar in Gears Five. Um, so when I was Paddock, I did it with a Russian accent and then the voice talent would just dub their voices over our performance and get 100% of the credit for all the performances and we got forgotten. Um, but I'm glad, you know, thank you very much. I was always great to hear a Gears fan that actually, uh, he knows the, knows the full breadth of the, the whole cast and not just the voice talent. Yeah, it's, uh, it's awesome. And you probably don't know this. And I know that, uh, Batista has been trying to lobby really hard for a Gears movie. Mm. With your roots kind of in the video game, do you feel like you're maybe a shoe in for some sort of role in a movie if that came about? I would love to do it. I've actually, uh, I've never managed to cross ties with Batista. I was, I've doubled, I've started to double three WWE champions and Batista was almost the fourth. Uh, I got an offer to double him in Toronto, but I was working on something in Vancouver and they, they were nervous about me flying over and back again. Um, yeah, you know what? I actually didn't think he'd make a great Marcus Phoenix. You know what? I was... When I first started doing Gears, the I was getting pulled aside by certain members of the studio and un, until they were told not to, and um, and asked like, you know, would you be interested in doing something if we do a movie or or a, a show or a convention or something like that? Uh, because the the role was just such a good fit. I mean, I can't lay claim to being a great actor in that one particular sense because just Marcus Phoenix felt so natural and ev everybody there felt the same way. So I was thinking, you know, it'd be cool to play him in a movie. But when Batista's name came up, it uh, it obviously makes sense. He's got he's got bankability. He's got box office draw. Um, but playing a character alongside his Marcus Phoenix, I would jump at the chance. Ace. Oh, that's awesome. I actually don't know the extent of your voiceover work. And I'm not a video game enthusiast There's so much. So that's very cool. Um did you find stunt work just from – I'm sorry, the voiceover work from the stunt work, just being in the acting field? Like, did somebody call upon you because – I mean, that's obviously how it got pulled in. Like, is it kind of all in the same pool? Like, did you, you have to audition for such a thing? Or, like, many things because of 
the people and the work that you've done, you you procured such a prestige, prestigious position because of what you've done before and who you've known. There, there are some jobs in, in stunts acting and voiceover work that you just get offered once you're around the gotcha. scene. You get known as somebody who can do the job. But most of the time, there is an audition element to it. Um, you know, I have done voiceover work for a lot of other, or a number of other video games. Um, Dead Rising 2 is probably the most prominent one. I played the most politically incorrect character in existence using my own name. <laughs> I'm actually I'm surprised I haven't canceled for it yet because it was like, <laughs> so foul and so non PC. Uh, it was made before the whole woke wave hit us. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I have to go to an audition for that. And that was, it, it all stems from starting as a stuntman in 2000. Uh, and that was a direct result of pro wrestling, but I would fall over sideways into the occasional acting role where it's like, we just need a guy to stand there and you know, shine a flashlight over there. And then it technically was an acting role, but not really. And gotcha. then in 2007, I started doing commentary for an MMA group called Bodog Fight and um, contract negotiations weren't going well. And a good friend of mine, Alex Ponovic, who's a very successful actor producer. Um, and ironically, the guy that I took over the role of Oscar for from in uh, Gears of War he uh he offered to hook me up with his agent uh, natasha tresco and she she negotiated with bulldog for me and got me a contract and then alex said well look you know natasha is not really a fight agent she's an acting agent why don't you get her to like start putting you out there for stuff and i said what i had said a bunch of times before to people when they asked me that question i said i'm not an actor i'm a stuntman and he looked at me and went well why and i didn't have an answer for him so hmm. the next day I, I signed up for acting classes and I, I asked Natasha to, you know, she's still my agent to this day and she's done a great oh, wow. job, a lot of work. And now, now that transferred over into also voiceover. Uh, so she, she gets me out there for both. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm naive about all of that stuff. As you know, when we worked on a uh, Dennis, we worked on a project called the main event, WWE films and Netflix came together. It was a couple of years back and uh, we were in Vancouver. I was in Vancouver for two months and Paul and I, that's the first time we actually had met face to face. And I was up in Vancouver and we had a great uh, stunt director and Lash. And, but being a veteran, you guys all knew each other and coming together to, to put that, like everything that went into doing that, like it was fascinating to me. Everything, the crash course that I got, thankfully you were there to help me through and kind of talk me through different things and lingo and so on and so forth. Um, you know, finding where, uh, you know, <laughs> got to go one, you know, two, ten one, like all yeah. the, <laughs> ten one, ten two. what, what the hell crafty is, where's crafty. I'm going to crafty all the time, get the coffee. Aren't we all, you know, mm. um, it was just very interesting to me, just like anything else, just like walking into pro wrestling and learning all the lingo that we've, you know, unfortunately I say unfortunate, it's just well, the way the world worked. Everything that we learned to keep kayfabe is now open an open book everywhere. Um, it was just fascinating to me, like that world and everything I had to learn about it and, and the way the people, you know, the pieces and parts move. Like there were people on that movie that you knew from working on other projects and just around town because a lot of people just kind of move to each and everything. And you might not see someone for a year or many years down the line, but you're, you know, it's a very tight knit group, I will say. That's it's, it's just a, it's a lot of fascinating. Yeah, a lot of parallels to pro wrestling in that respect. You know, you probably know it's that where. Yeah. You know, you could walk into a locker room in Japan next week and see somebody you haven't seen in five years and then just yes. pick up where they left off because you've done a show in Indiana with them and you did a show in Toronto with them and you did you know, over the years. Uh, yeah, so with Vancouver being such a relatively small film community where everybody works a lot uh, until recently. Um, yeah, so you, you get those relationships and, and it, it uniquely benefits me on shows like that because and I usually get a call for anything pro wrestling related. Sure. Uh, that was everybody. Everybody uh, in stunts generally has their own particular foothold that got them in the door, whether it's a relative or a skill set or a style or something like that. So we have people who are gymnasts. You know, uh, I've got a buddy who grew up in the favelas of Brazil and he was a capoeirista. I got a buddy who stunt double Jet Li and grew up doing wushu. And, and everybody's got a different road in. My road was pro wrestling. Um, so having come out of the pro wrestling world, and now having so many years in the stunt world, uh, it's it's easy for me to kind of be a mediator and a go-between. When somebody like yourself comes in and, you know, I can give everybody the heads up that, yeah, you know, if Ace tells you something wrestling related, you can take it absolutely to the bank. So they don't have to vet you. 
And at the same time, I can, I can help to translate for you. And, and as I had when I was stunt doubling Steve Austin, you know, there were times that the director was trying to articulate what he wanted Steve to do. And, and the message wasn't quite getting across. And it's like, well, there's a wrestling name for that. And I tell Steve more way of the races. So it's kind of cool uh, to be able to, to be something of a translator in that respect. Indeed. Yeah, no, it was great. It was a great experience for me. Um, I just changed my, my career trajectory was changing at that point, right at that time, going in to be like a full-time coach for everything. Not that I haven't been a coach, you know, on and off my whole life, but actually making it a career turn for me. And that was a great jump start for me and a great project for me. And I'm super proud of everything that we've done, especially when they, when it came time to shoot the wrestling and everything that we had put together, uh, they mm-hmm. shot. And I think it was done because they were just segments of matches and just, you know, caught in action. I, I, if I correct me if I'm wrong, I think that we were done within 15, 20 minutes <laughs> with everyone, with everything they had to do. It was pretty quick and they were amazed at how fast it was done. And I just put my hands up and I said, thank God, pro, you know, we get it done in one shot, you know, unless they need the different angles. I think every now and then it, they made a, they might have shot with just different ideas, like two times of the same scene or the same segment of that scene. But it was just fascinating to me. And I was pretty proud. I was very proud of what, the work we had done. Still am. It's amazing to me. I haven't watched it in a few years, but amazing that what we put together and then came to fruition the way it did as well. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool when you spend so much time putting it together and you only really see the previous version. And like I, I, I guinea pigged all the wire gags in, in the wrestling scenes beforehand. So you see him go from that to, like you said, the in-ring and also being able to kind of show off pro wrestling a bit, which often doesn't get the respect it deserves and show them that, yeah, you know, we, we do stuff with minimal rehearsal, sometimes no rehearsal and, and we exactly. get it done. And yeah. uh, so it's uh, it, it, in certain ways um, it outshone a lot of stunt performers that I've worked with, with regard to, oh. being able to just get the choreography and like, yeah, 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 okay, I got it. And then get in there and do it. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yeah. It was in, in it's and the great thing was that it's, it's akin to when I coach a match or I do a main event on a dynamite or something on NXT or whatever I've done and coach someone out there and give them ideas. And it comes off the way we envision, you know, um, we're, we're not, you know, trying to hide anything here. It is, you know, they're, we talk things over and, but it doesn't always go to plan. And when something comes out and you get the reaction you were looking for, you know, the best, the best pro wrestling artists do a lot of things off cuff in a lot of ways. And you're able to feel the emotion of the people. And when that happens, Holy cow, the rush that you get. And I had the same rush when we watched that happen and it came out on film. So Mm -hmm. it was very excellent. Um, We kind of jumped way ahead into stuff. (laughs) I want to backtrack a little bit, if you would. Um, talk a little bit about your beginnings at the dungeon. Maybe a little bit about the Canadian Death Tours, and then transition. I know I'm throwing you all over here. Let's start with that, and then I really want to talk about Paint Craze. Okay, um, this all started in 1991. Uh, I was working in a department store, which was kind of like a really early primitive version of Amazon called Consumers Distributing, and hating every second of it. And uh, on my break, I was leafing through Pro Wrestling Illustrated magazine, and I saw an ad for the Hart Brothers Pro Wrestling Academy, the Dungeon. Mm-hmm. And at that point, you know, kayfabe was in full effect, so I wouldn't have even known how to get into the wrestling business. And then I see this. So my my good friend Carlos Leal you know, gave me a few thousand dollars and drove me two thousand miles from Kitchener, Ontario, my hometown, to Calgary, Alberta, to get set up and and become a become a pro wrestler. Yeah, I'll, I'll oh, never wow. forget him for that. And um, so I, I, I went to uh, my first day at Hart Brothers and the instructors were Lance Storm and Chris Jericho, who are just rounding out their own first rookie, their own rookie years. They didn't even uh-huh. have a year in, but they were Lance and Chris. So they had advanced way faster than 99% of people do in the business and mm-hmm. were actually qualified to teach. You know, Lance has, has said in conversations about that in, in subsequent years, he, because he's such a perfectionist, he said, I, I wish I'd had a better grasp of psychology. So I could have taught you guys that in the school, but you know, he, he had like 10 months in the business and I actually got a really good education in the, in just the, the nuts and bolts of the workings of a match. So we did the dungeon with Lance and Chris. Uh, Keith Hart was there for two or three days at the beginning, just to make sure the checks cleared. And then he disappeared. <laughs> yeah. So may may I ask if it was the proper dungeon in the basement of the Hart house 
or where no. was it? Where was this at? They had relocated it. It was in the Silver Dollar Action Center. And this is, we all have moments in our life that we'll never forget. And mine was yeah. showing up for at the assigned address on July 1st, 1991, getting off the bus and looking up the hill at this building with a giant bowling pin on a podium outside of it. <laughs> and thinking, I just got hosed. This is a freaking bowling alley. And it, uh -huh. it partially was. It was an event center that included a bowling alley, but there, there okay. was a room in there that had a ring. And uh, right. it was in it. So I did not get hosed. I got a good education. And um, yeah, guys like Big Titan and Dr. Luther would roll in on a regular basis just to get some ring time. And Black Dragon, Brett Como used to come in all the time. So I had some good guys to, to train with and learn from. Excellent. Yo, I, Excellent. I, I um, want to jump in and ask this question. Uh, you were mentioned the psychology part. And one of my favorite questions to ask guys are, you know, normally the guys who train them with in-ring work are not the same guys who train them with the psychology part of wrestling. How long after you felt comfortable or you got this education in the ring, did you start learning about the psychology? I was a really bad student with regards to psychology. And it's, uh, I, at my very best, I could be led through a decent match by a good worker. Uh, the guy I probably learned the most about psychology from was Dr. Luther. Uh, that guy was by far the biggest influence across the board on my, my wrestling career. And uh, he taught me what I was able to pick up. I, I understand the business way better now than when I was in it. Uh, I, I, Steve Austin asked me once, he said, well, why do you think you never got very good? And I, I didn't have an answer for him at the time, but I do now, which is that I just don't think I was fully ready to let go of being a mark. I love the feeling of being a fan and buying into the illusion. And you've got to be ready to, to let that go. I, I remember the day that Lance Storm wised us up, uh, which was a very big day because like I said, kayfabe was in full effect. You had to earn your way in. So he, you know, they ran us ragged for, I think, four weeks. And over half the class quit. And once they had realized, okay, these guys really want it, they, Lance sat us down and he gave us the talk about this is what the business is about. And he said, now that I've told you this, you're never going to watch wrestling the same way again. And I remember a part of me got a little sad on that. And it was the immature part of me that didn't want to let go of being a fan. So I think that got in my way. And kept me from fully understanding psychology until pretty late in my career, like in the late 90s. So I, I would say, yeah, probably around 96, 97 was when I actually started being a proper, like somewhat mature pro wrestler with regards to my mindset, with regards to psycho uh, psychology. Very interesting. <clears throat> the, can the, can the, the Canadian death tours. Hmm. Uh, that was Tony Candelo's gig out of Winnipeg, Manitoba. Tony's still around, a notorious Canadian promoter. And yeah, he would put a bunch of wrestlers in a van and just drive north and north and north and north and north into these unbelievably remote areas that were not accessible by land during the summer. You had to wait for the ground to freeze. And a big part of your trip would be over frozen lakes and also driving over frozen marshland. And there were times you could only do like five miles an hour. Uh, so that was my first tour. I was offered that while I was living in Calgary and didn't realize until the tour was over that not all tours were like that because by the end of it, I was horrified. Like every tour is sure. like, this. Sure. <laughs> so this is the era pre-internet. There's, there's no GPS, there's no cell phones, no anything like that. So once you're out, you're gone. And if your van breaks down, you die because there is such a gap from one Indian reservation to the next. The, wow. the first stop on the tour on my first tour was the Oxford house reservation. I was a 23 hour trip from Winnipeg to Oxford House. My gosh. The, the, yeah, the ground was just so, so ridiculously, you know. I hate, I hate there. driving three hours now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 23 hours. And uh, the heater, the floor heater in the back of the van broke. And I was a dumb kid. I didn't dress appropriately for the unbelievable. That was the first time I've ever been terrified by cold in my life. Mm. It was that cold. And my, I couldn't feel my feet when we got to Oxford House. I was legitimately concerned when I pulled my boots off, they'd be, my feet would be black. Thankfully they weren't, but um, that was, that's the death tour. And, and you would just, it was a lot of boredom. It was a lot of uh, quite frankly, it's quite depressing because you get to these reservations and realize these people are born and destined to lose. And it's not their fault. You know, they're isolated yeah. on these reservations. They've got no access to proper education. They've got no access to and They're surrounded by drug abuse and all kinds of other abuse. And so, you know, we would do these say no to drug speeches for kids in the elementary school and half the kids in the school would be stoned. 
at 10 and 11 years old. So it was an unbelievable crippling poverty. I've been to, I, by this point, I had been to Africa when I was a kid. And this was equivalent poverty to what I had seen on the streets of Nairobi. So it, um, it was really eye opener uh, about the situation up there. But it was also, as far as seasoning you as a wrestler, I came away from that tour well armed for any other tour because no matter how rough it got, I had that to compare it to. I would end up doing three of those tours. And, um, you know, Tony would often bring his um, midget wrestling ring because it was easier to fit into the ring truck. Okay. That's only 10 feet rope to rope. Ace, you okay. can tell everybody, like the smallest, <laughs> you can tell wrestling is 60 by 16. Yes. And uh, so 10 by 10, you're rest- I'm wrestling Edge, who's six, 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 seven in his boots. I'm about yeah. six, three, six, four in mine. You try taking hip tosses and backdrops in a 10 by 10 foot ring and not going right out into the crowd. It's, it's It really teaches you how to work in compact areas. Indeed, indeed. Now, what were the crowds like out there? Because I, I like asking guys from Canada, you know, the culture shock coming from America to Canada and how fans react. How do fans react on an Indian reservation to wrestling? Um, well, it, a lot of them were just overjoyed to have any kind of entertainment. Um, you know, they're so isolated, there's so little to do that when wrestling comes to town, it's a real special event. Um, there were instances of drunk people trying to get involved with the matches and having to get a boot in the face before they climb through the ropes. Um, <laughs> a big human wave of fans tried to rip Lance Storm's towel off as he was coming out of the showers. That's the, that's the only time I've seen Lance furious and screaming at somebody. That's because he was just, yeah, he, he had to do something to get these people back. Um, but it was, um, they were generally enthusiastic crowds and generally happy that we were there. Uh, there was an exception when uh, Bulldog Bob Brown, who nobody liked, uh, oh, he slapped a kid in the face. What? Uh, so, yeah, a little kid, like eight, nine years old. And the kid was screaming something at him. And he's the heel. Of course, the kid's screaming. And he went up, like, just pie faced the kid. And uh, that night, Edge uh, just had a feeling. He goes, I'm going to go out and check our vans. And it was so cold there that when you park, there is um, an outlet with a cord you can plug your engine into. So the engine block doesn't freeze completely over, which it will if you just just park your car outside. And somebody had gone out and unplugged all our vans to strand us. So thank God he caught it, and we got out of there the next morning. Wow. Yeah. Much dislike for the bulldog. I don't, except for Harley, because Harley was friends with him. I've never heard any good thing about Bulldog Bob Brown. And now that's, I was trying to think. Um, I have a friend who does another podcast called The Wrestling Perspective. Uh, this is, he, he does, or the worst territory ever. This is Wrestling Perspective. My bad. Uh, but he <laughs> talked to, what? I'm la- Tell me about this wrestling perspective that you've heard of. It's the <laughs> shit. Oh. This dude from Detroit. Holy shit. The worst. I hated we'll wrestling in Chicago. Detroit. <laughs> I had my best wrestling days in Detroit, man. I love that city. I actually like wrestling in Detroit as well. Uh, my friend Chris Goff in Kansas City does one on the Kansas City territory, and he brings up some central states. And he had uh, Bob Geigel's daughter on, and she talked about Bob Brown. And Bob Brown would complain nonstop about everything. He'd be over for Christmas and Thanksgiving dinner. Well, this is a shit. This is terrible. Yeah. And this is terrible. Well, thanks for coming and get the f out. You know. Um, mm. But I've never really heard great things about Bob Brown. He was a miserable person, you know, and it's um, it, it always bugged me because I knew he was a veteran. And so I was wanting to learn from veterans. And, and I had a similar experience with Rip Rogers in California where it's like, dude, I'm, I'm here to learn. Yes, I'm a stupid kid. I, I admitted that coming in. I told you I got like <laughs> yeah. nine matches. And and when they act like dicks, it just it completely turns you off the person forever. And then Bob was just not a pleasant guy. Um, he didn't get along with people well. He was really self-serving and, and angry all the time. And and also like to eat cloves of raw garlic in the van, which would cause gaseous emanations that were basically a violation of the Geneva Convention. It was it, it was like Tony smoking in the van was bad enough. Like the, the, the boys who smoked and Tony used to smoke all the time. And that would kill me enough in a closed because you end up in the windows. You open the windows, you'll die. Sure. Right? Yeah. But then when Bob got the garlic out, it was, oh, my freaking God. He never he never copped to it either. He'd always pretend he didn't do anything. And it just it would just be wave after wave, man. That was that was a legitimate torture. So, unfortunately, you know, I 
I know you're not supposed to speak ill of people who aren't around anymore. Bob was right, right, right. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's great. Wow. Yeah, so this Detroit shit, this Detroit shit. Oh, it's killing me. No, so, I'm uh, you know what? I'm going to jump in. And one of the questions I really want to ask before we get too far down memory lane here is with – acting your mma your wrestling background and with the success of a dan lambert and aew as a manager has it really kind of crossed your mind that maybe this is an avenue that you could go into where you kind of have all those tools to make a probably a phenomenal hill manager i'd love to do it but i, I just it seems like the era of the manager is kind of gone i mean there's you've got guys like don Callis and and um paul Heyman who are doing it at a high level but overall um, you're not really seeing managers rotated in and out the way they used to. Um, I, I I would be really interested in doing commentary for a, a large company again. I mean, Bodog Fight was, uh, they were a mega million dollar company uh, in the mid 2000s. They were one of the biggest companies in the world for the brief time they were around. We were doing shows in Russia, Costa Rica, in the States and in Canada. So I really cut my teeth, you know, calling Fedor fights and, and uh, you know, calling really, really big fights. Um and then recently got to get my feet wet again. My my good friend Stuart Fulton, who does commentary, he's the preeminent um, English language commentator for combat sports and pro wrestling in Japan. And he uh, he asked me if I wanted to come out while I was there in uh, January and do commentary <laughs> for Noah's New Year's Eve show. So I got to, in a surreal moment, I got to call a match involving the King of Pancras, Masakatsu Funaki, who I fought in 1997. So that was really cool. And so that, that's that's something that really appeals to me. I wouldn't say no to a manager role if they decided to revive them because, yeah, I I do have a foot in so many different worlds that, that are applicable. But, um, you know, either that or commentary, you know, either one, I think I definitely think I got the tools to do either. Very interesting question because uh, I agree that the manager role, um, Dave Prezak, who is – someone that helped a lot of us out in the Midwest when we had the school uh, who famously started shimmer women's wrestling, who if there's women, a women's wrestling revolution, they basically have Dave to thank because of his fascination with women's wrestling and everything that <clears throat> himself, he himself and like Alice in danger had helped put together in the early days and continued with all the women coming over and working there. Um, Dave had a reel put together that said, man, a juror. It's, a, you know, because Bobby Heenan was done by that point. Paulie Dangerously was kind of done by the two, you know, but when ECW folded, though he is, he, he says he's an advocate. He's not, he doesn't really get involved in matches anymore. He's not using the phone like he used to. He's a great mouthpiece, but he's, he's a mouthpiece for it. It's, it's really hard for, it, it's just, it's kind of a, a forgotten spot and an interesting thing where they don't get, some managers get too goofy, too much on the comedy side because, you know, they don't understand that you don't bump this guy right away. Like, it's got to be a build. Like, everything's got to be a build. Nowadays, things are hot shotted a lot, depending where you're at. But uh, it's just such a lost art for someone like a Jim Cornette, you know, back in those days. Like, Cornette didn't take a bump every night of the week, you know, if it depended who it was and the caliber of the match and where they were in whatever storyline, you know. It's, it's just a forgotten art. It's also a really good way to develop talent that I think is is sorely missed. I mean, my personal opinion is Wardlow would benefit greatly from having a manager, somebody who he could leg legitimately ride with on the road, who's got experience, and also do a little bit of talking for him because I think he's still got some rough edges to sand off. I, I think he's a guy that, you know, he's definitely got all the pieces in place to be a superstar, but I think he's pushed to a little bit higher level than he can handle right now. And he can grow into that level easily, but a manager. Sure. Oh, for sure with him would definitely benefit a guy from greatly. So it's, it's a, a manager is a great talent development tool too. If you put the right person in that place. He actually has Arn Anderson with him now, which I think if there's anyone you're going to, you know, I would walk up and talk to Arn. The man's been in this industry for so long, but also doing the type of job that I do as a producer, which again, in pro wrestling, if you stop learning, you're an idiot because you don't know everything. There's always something, especially as a coach, a coach in the sense of producing a match, so on and so forth. But he's produced some of the biggest main events in the world. And I'll even beyond just, you know, pulling the mark, putting the mark hat on the fanboy, asking about an old angle or storyline. Hey, how would you book this match? I got four minutes. What do you think? How do you think this should go? This is what I think, you know, would bounce off. But I think he'll, he'll, he'll 
he'll get some great nuggets of knowledge from Arn just viewing what he's doing and giving him some. I, I didn't know this until recently that I, I saw Arn uh, quote that he uh, he helped Goldberg out with a lot of his runs. So I think it's oh, really? an interesting pairing with Wardlow and the comparisons of, of you know what they're trying to do, what's what's trying to happen with a guy like that. But, yeah, yeah, it's very good. I'm glad you can do better than Arn for an information resource. And sure. I actually use Lance Storm and William Regal for that uh, in movies. If I'm working on a pro wrestling related movie and I get stumped on something like you and I did it a, a bunch on the main event where we like, oh, how are we going to make this work? How are we going to do this? And, you know, satisfy everybody involved and make, make it all make sense. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, if I need advice in those areas, I'll, I'll touch base with Regal or, or Lance and, and do the same thing. Everybody needs a sense. Indeed. Indeed. Um, you mentioned you you talked about Pancrase a little bit, um, or at least one of the one of the guys you did commentary for. I I think this is one of the most interesting things to me about you is that you I'm not going to say on a farce, but on a whim, you told them you could fight, and you <laughs> learned MMA on the job training by getting your ass whipped by Minoru Suzuki. I actually owe that to Detroit because this all started with uh, I was working in. Malcolm Monroe's company. Um, in oh, South Kansas, I love it. XICW. Yeah, XICW. Yeah, AT Hug, Malcolm Monroe. You know, rest in peace, Malcolm. Um, glad to see they're still going. But I was, uh, you know, it was a, a pretty successful heel in that territory as Death Wolf. But I was also a huge fan of Japanese shoot fighting because in 1992, uh, Dr. Luther caught fire in FMW. And so he was going to Japan all the time and bringing back these VHS tapes pre UFC of shoot fighting. Japanese mixed martial arts. And that was the first time I'd seen large scale like arena events with these, these guys that were fighting on the ground and fighting, standing up. Like, this is amazing. This is, I, I love this. So I wanted to learn just a little bit of it just so I knew how to shoot well enough that if any of my matches broke down, I could take care of myself. And, and so I've been watching and, and I found a place in Toronto that I could take the bus up to. And, and it was the only place in Ontario that rented Pancras tapes, I'll bring them back and copy the tapes and then take them back again. I just watch them over and over. So I was a huge Pancrase fan in a time where hardly anybody in North America knew what Pancrase was. It was the number one MMA group in the world, but it just hardly anybody knew what it was. And then one day I saw this lady in the aftermath of an ICW show walking around talking to people. She was hanging out with Sabu, who was there to watch. And she looked really familiar. And then I realized I had seen her literally hanging off the side of a cage on a UFC event where Dan Severn, who she was managing at the time, was fighting Hoist Gracie, and that was Phyllis Lee. So I introduced mm-hmm. myself. I said, if you're you know, <laughs> booking wrestlers, I'm looking for work. And she said, well, I'm not booking wrestlers, but since the Sh- Ken Shamrock just left this group in Japan, they've asked me to start booking foreign talent for them. And uh, have you heard of Pancreas, she called it. <laughs> you know, pancreas. And it took me a second. Are like, you talking about Pancreas? And she said, yeah. And I just started rattling off all the names and the big names and all the big fights and stuff like that. Her eyebrows went way up because she just she wasn't used to, you know, guys in their 20s at that time in North America, no, even knowing what it was. So, you know, technology of the day, she took my number and she faxed to be an application form. And she said, <laughs> well, you know, they're looking for fighters. So, you know, if you want to apply and I'm like, as a goof, because I'd always wanted to wrestle in Japan. I had a few near misses with. Uh, Victor Kionis was going to book me at one point and FMW is going to book me at one point. It always fell through and I really wanted to see Japan. So I thought, let's just throw this at the wall. It's not going to happen because they've never taken a Canadian yet. And, you know, I've never had any combat sport experience. I didn't even wrestle in high school. No kickboxing, no, no boxing, no wrestling, no judo. No, I trained judo for fun, but no competitive experience. And she sent me this thing. I, I, I filled out the facts for her. I just filled it up with lies. Like all this complete bullshit. <laughs> And uh, there was one section that said, who are your favorite fighters? So I put my legit two favorite fighters, which was this guy, Yanagizawa, who I liked because he was he was as big as me, this big hulking guy, and Fanaki, and, and I sent it in. Forgot about it. And then a month later, I get this call out of nowhere, and it's Phyllis. I pick up the phone, and she goes, Moshi Moshi. And I remember Dr. Luther telling me that's how they answer the phone in Japan. Uh-huh. So I'm like, are you saying what you, I think you're saying? And she said, yeah, you're fighting in Japan next month. Oh, <laughs> it worked. Like, now what? Like, yeah. I'm screwed. This, so this is the equivalent of somebody who's never had a competitive fight going straight to UFC and fighting a contender, like fighting a, a top five guy. 
Uh, so I immediately um, touched base with a guy in my hometown named Wayne Erdman, who was on the 76 Olympic team, the same Olympics that uh, Bad News Allen won the gold, but bronze medal. Uh, so he knew news. Wayne's a Canadian judo legend. And being an absolutely great guy, in spite of only barely knowing me, he because I was broke, he agreed to train me on credit and have me pay him out of my fight purse when I got home. And I did not screw him over. I paid him, but he trusted me to do that. Wow. And Wayne's ground game was crazy good. So he just showed me enough that I could combine that with the strength that I had built up from being a competitive powerlifter and strongman because I had just taken mm -hmm. third place in the Canadian Strongman Championships. And um, it it gave me enough that I had a reasonable expectation of not dying in the fight. And then I'm off to Japan, and the first guy I'm fighting is ranked number three in the world, uh, just beat Oleg Taktarov, and had previously gone the distance with Vitaly Klitschko in a kickboxing match. And that was Ryushi Nagazawa, one of the favorite guys that I had said on the forum. So I thought they were going to give me one of their lower level guys to test me out, and they gave me top three. <laughs> but even then, I got to Japan, and just with with everything being so unsure about mixed martial arts back then and shoot fighting, and the blurry line, which you can attest to, is the blurry line between MMA and pro wrestling in Japan. Mm -hmm. There were groups like Rings and UWFI where almost all the fights were works. They just looked real to the uneducated eye. Right, right. And people were wondering about Pancrase, like, because you know, they looked the same as UWF and Rings, but are they real or are they fake? So the whole week that I was there leading up to the fight, I'm waiting for somebody to come, come up and give me the finish. And nobody uh -huh. did. And I'm I'm an idiot. They're like, I don't even have a mouth guard. I don't have a groin piece. I got nothing. I got have a trainer. Uh -huh. And I'm walking to the ring wondering, like, did they forget to give me the finish? I don't want to be shooting on this guy. if he's He thinks I'm working. And then I got in the ring and I looked down and there was blood splatters all over the canvas. And that's that's the moment I knew, okay, we're fighting for real. How do you change your yeah. mindset like that? I mean – don't I, I've never been in a real fight in my life. I've never been punched in the face. I've done a very good That's job. Alive. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, but the, 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 the mindset of, you know, going into a wrestling match is probably different than going in, knowing you're going to get punched in the face. What's your game plan after that? How do you mentally prepare for that kind of moment? One guy, guy will owe for the rest of my life is guy Mesger who would go on to become King of Pancreas and who won a UFC title, beat Tito Ortiz in the UFC. Uh, Guy was one of their big stars. And they were picking three of us up at the airport when I got there. Uh, myself, Guy Mesger, and Semi Schilt from Holland, who would be a K-1 champion, Pancreas champion. Semi's a, a, an animal. So we're all there, and, and Guy is just a, a gregarious dude. So he starts talking to me, and he's asking me questions, and I'm trying to be as cagey as possible because I got nothing. Like, he's like, oh, asking me about my fight <laughs> background. And I'm like, I, I'm trying to be evasive, but I think he picked up on it pretty quick that I was out of my depth and just took it upon himself to help me get acclimatized in Japan. Like, the entire week that we were there, he'd take me into the Pancras Dojo, and we'd roll and stuff, and he'd, he'd learn what I knew and, more importantly, what I didn't know is most of it. And he gave me a detailed scouting report on Yanagazawa. So I went in way better prepared than I should have been because of Guy being so generous with me during the week before the fight. Uh, I was still breaking it. I was still terrified, like absolutely mm -hmm. terrified. Because at the end of the day, I've never even had like a peewee martial arts tournament. I've never had a high school wrestling meet. I've never had to stand across a ring or mat from somebody and know we're going to fight. You know, I've only had pro wrestling matches where it's cooperative. And the first time I'm doing it, it's in front of 10,000 people halfway across the world against a certified killer in the best group in the world. So it was a very steep learning curve. But uh, thankfully, what Guy advised me to do is a strategy that that I kind of favor anyway, which is if you're going to die, you may as well just throw yourself at the person and, and then leave as many marks <laughs> as you can. Go down swinging. Go down and swinging. It's actually a good strategy for that guy. And it worked out. You know, I lost, but I did well enough that they were really happy with it. You know, in, in Japan, winning or losing is secondary, unlike in North America. It's how hard you fought, how much you tried, how much fighting spirit you showed. And they liked the fact that I was so aggressive and fought so hard. And when the fight was over, uh, immediately, you know, I guess I looked at me and said, you're coming back. I thought he was just being nice to me, but he was right. That's amazing. There's nothing more comparable to that if you think of i mean everyone should know by this point 
if you're in any type of MMA enthusiast, uh, Don Fry and Takayama. Um, holy shit, <laughs> the punches yeah. to the face. But oh, that yeah. elevated Takayama in the pro wrestling world. You know, he didn't win that. But the fight that he had, holy shit, the star that it made him. You know, not that he wasn't exactly, but it took him that next level, dare I say. So but that's that's just phenomenal to me. And so your next tour, would that be the one where you uh, encountered Suzuki? Or was this on the first yeah. one? Well, I, I figured it was going to be one and done. But once I got out of that ring, I was I was over the moon because like I, I got on my teeth, you know, my my. my Twig and berries are in place. I'm not dead. <laughs> I got to see Japan. This is this is great. Okay, I got through the fight. I survived. And I thought that was it. You know, I lost. So they're not going to bite me back. And um, a week after I got home, Phyllis calls again, and she's losing her mind. And she said, look, they, they see something in you. Uh, do you want to go back and and live at their dojo for six weeks? I'm like, uh, now this is immediately after a few fighters, including Igor Zinoviev, were arrested in Quebec, Canada, and put in jail for fighting mixed martial arts. Like my chosen wow. sport was highly yeah. illegal in my home country, and I'm being offered a chance. and And I'm living in my friend's auto shop. I'm unemployed. I'm broke, yeah. and I've got a chance to fly across the world and, and train with some of the best fighters on the planet. So, of course, I'm going to say yes. I'm not even knowing what I'm getting into. And she said, "Okay, good. Um, four days after you get there, you're going to fight in Nagoya, and then they're going to take you to the dojo in Yokohama. You're going to stay there for six weeks." Uh, oh, and by the way, your opponent is Masakazu Funaki, the reigning world champion, the king of Pancrase. So Ooh. my first two fights are 30 days apart, and number three in the world, number one in the world. So I just I just jumped in the deep end with the Sharks. Holy cow. So, I, yeah. That's, that's I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, once again, never been in anything physical. I don't even know how... <clears throat> one would mentally prepare for that. It just blows my mind to go from, you know, a hard fart first match to fighting th their top guy. That that's got to be a mind fuck for you going into that situation. Or is it like, hey, they trust me, I can do this. Let's go. I wish I had thought I could do this because I actually, mind blowingly, because this would have been the biggest upset in MMA history. I actually had a chance to win that fight, and mindset screwed took that chance away from me I, I my own fault um but prior to the fight it was really freaking me out because it's like well, okay you know i survived with the oh, he's number three but fanaki's fanak like i watched his legendary 1996 fight with boss rutin which is another one of those fights where fanaki didn't win but it made him into an even bigger megastar because he just he was he was fighting for the beautiful death as as spartans say you know he he, he fought with everything he had and became a legend in the process. And I was a, a, a big fan of Boss Rutan too. So I met him in the locker room that night and I'm sitting in this locker room and I'm, I'm looking at, okay, that's Semi Schilt, who's like one of the, the home's best fighters. And that's Boss Rutan, the legendary King of Pancrase. And I'm on the main event after these guys. Like this ain't right. <laughs> the whole thing is freaking surreal. And I went out into the hall and I was just pacing up and down the hall and lo losing my losing my mind. And um, this fighter, Manabu Yamada, who I, I want to cross paths with him again just to thank him one more time because he didn't even know who I was. And Yamada was a guy that was in the Shuto promotion, which is the oldest Japanese MMA promotion. And he had jumped over to Pancrase. And he actually came over. I guess he took pity on me. He came over and he like, took me by the shoulders. He's like, it's okay. Relax, relax. Like it's, it's two hours before I'm going to fight and I'm already burning all my calories. So he, wow. he helped me. He was a really good dude, man. I really like Yamada. And uh, yeah, man, then uh, then it was just get in there and, and and again, throw everything I can at the guy. Early in the fight, I got so my hand around the back of Fanaki's head and hit him with an uppercut as hard as I could. Uh, rookie mistake, I let go with the hand that was holding his head, you know, so his head was able to whip back and disperse some of the force. But even so, he like looked at me and his eyes were glazed over. And I was so too much in awe of who he was that I just went in there thinking he's Fanaki. I can't hurt him. Like I'm just me. He's uh, Fanaki. not realizing I have one advantage. I'm way stronger than him. And if I can use that. So he kind of staggered back into the ropes. And by the time I thought to come after him, then I'm throwing these big stupid barn door strikes. And they didn't know how to strike back then. It, it was too late. 
But uh, I, I always wondered how bad I hurt him. And then 23 years later, when I went back to Japan and reunited with Fanaki, we we're having dinner and he brought it up out of nowhere. And he said, you know what? You made me throw out my game plan. I said, what do you mean? He goes, you hit me so hard. He said, my plan was to do what me and Suzuki used to do with guys like you, you know, guys that we were far better than where we would toy with you and kind of play with you a little bit, let you get something and get out of, make an entertainment. Sure. Yeah. Because they were so, so good. You know, with guys like Boss Rooten, you'd have to really fight them. With guys like us, you could toy with them like a cat with a mouse and then put us away with these really fancy catch wrestling submissions you can't get on somebody who's really good. And Fanaki said he had a specific submission in mind for me that was really intricate and fancy and looked good. He said, when you hit me with that uppercut, game plan went out the window, and I thought, I have to get this guy on the ground and finish him with whatever I can get. I need to end this fight now. Wow. And uh, so he ended up getting me with just like a, a top wrist lock. And he said, that wasn't a good-looking submission. It's not what I wanted, but you made me throw away my game plan. So I can at least hold that close. It was, like, it was only, only my second fight ever, and I managed to at least shake up one of the greatest fighters in the world. My God, what a hell of a compliment, though. 20, 23 years later, you're like, holy fuck. Did you, did you have a clue? Like you said, in the match, you realized I should have capitalized here in the fight, I should say. Um, but after all these years, he tells you that, and you're like, I fucking knew it. I knew I had him. I wasn't sure until he told me that because it was I didn't know if I was I didn't want to overrate myself because it's still to me right. still Fanaki. like now he's a friend of course. Now he's, he's, he's now that he doesn't have the pressure of carrying a company on his shoulders he's a totally different guy so every time sure. I go to Japan we hang out but you know back then it was just he was a god and so I never knew for sure until he told me and it's, it's I'm so ambivalent because part of me is like oh if only I'd hung out of the back of his head like that <laughs> seriously like that would have been a, a much huger upset than Matt's Matt Sarah over GSP or anything like that but on the other hand, you know, for, for where I was at and for the, the mental obstacles that I was putting in front of myself as well, um, it, it's a feather in my cap to have him all that time later say, yeah, you, you, know, you gave me pause. You made me change my game plan. Uh, listen, I know we're getting to the end of this podcast. And one of the things I wanted to touch on with your love of wrestling and you being able to stunt double for almost four, you know, wrestling champions is uh the the fan geek out thing because even me today uh i've been in many baseball locker rooms i know you know i've been very lucky to have some pretty famous friends a still one of them so i <laughs> try to act cool and i i was being nice there ace uh yeah. lars how about that is that better lars being one of them so uh do you do you allow yourself to be a fan and and geek out in front of these guys or do you put that professional you know face on and in the inside you're just like holy shit it's stone cold steve austin there have been times where like the the fan in me is 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 really digging what's happening but yeah i, I try to be professional because i'm there to do a job like when i worked with steve austin yeah it's like holy crap it's steve austin but he's also relying on us because he said something very similar to what Ace said, which is when he got uh, to Vancouver for the first of a number of films he shot up here, he told everybody in production, myself included, he said, look, I'm the new kid here. You know, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm top dog in wrestling, but this is film work and I've got stuff to learn. So if you've got anything, if you see me doing anything wrong, uh, if you have any ideas on how I can be better, tell me, you know, don't be intimidated. And so I knew he was relying on me for that. So it was cool from a fan perspective, but you know, I, I'm there to do a job and I'm doing a disservice to the very guy that I'm, I'm thinking is cool to work with if I don't do that. So it, it generally is, um, I can, I can put the fan aside in cases like that. Did, did you get your geek out moment though with him? Did you get that one moment alone with him? Like, <laughs> Listen, I got to tell you, Steve, you're, you're, or whoever that guy was for you, because like I said, uh, a lot of guys come across on this podcast that I'll be like, holy shit, I can't believe uh, just the other couple of weeks ago, Jake the Snake Roberts, you know, you grow up watching the guy, uh, you, you watch him redeem himself, whether you like him or not. He's a good storyteller and part of my youth growing up. Do you, did you have that moment with maybe anybody, even if it's just yeah. in a locker room somewhere? Yeah, because like I said, I, I was... When I, I was wrestling all over the world, I was going to Japan and fighting, but I was still broke in Canada. So I, I didn't have a lot of money for things like vacations or trips and stuff. And, and I always used to think, you know, I, I'm going to do something special when I finally get a few bucks in my pocket. And in 2003, 
that was the year my career took off. Um, working on the Chronicles of Riddick for the entire summer. I actually taught Vin Diesel how to take a vertical suplex on that show. And um, <laughs> I, uh, at the end of shooting, you know, I had some money and, and I had, um, you know, I, I was with my then fiance and just thought, what do I want to do? You know, I, I, I got some spare time, got some money. What do I want to do? And the first thing that came into my mind was I want to meet Judo Jean LaBelle because uh, he had been my hero for so long. And I had ended up following him into a number of fields that he was a legend in. Like aside from strength sports, everything I've done at a high level, mixed martial arts, movies and TV, professional wrestling, Gene's a legend in all three. And so I, I wanted to meet this guy, you know, and, um, you know, he won the first ever televised MMA show, uh, MMA fight in history. The guy's walking history. So that's what I did. And I, I booked a vacation, um, LA and Vegas and the LA leg was specifically to meet Gene. And I set it up and, and went in and met Gene. And while I was there, um, you know, we sat down, we talked for a while. He busted my balls ruthlessly because that's what he does. Forced me to take his class in my blue jeans. You know, I thought the visit was over. <laughs> but then I had told him I'd fought in Japan. So he's like, he said, am I allowed to swear on this podcast? Yeah. Well, fuck yeah. Oh yeah. yeah We've said fuck a million times. Yeah. I, uh, his students were starting to drift in. I'm like, oh, Gene, I, I see your class about to start, so uh, I'm going to get going. He goes, what do you mean? So your class is starting. He goes, yeah, class is starting. Get on the mat. I said, well, Gene, I didn't bring my workout clothes. He goes, I don't fucking care what you brought. Get on the mat. <laughs> Gene LaBelle tells you to get on the mat. You get on the mat. So I just got to class in my blue jeans. And um, after it was over, we're driving back, and my my, my <laughs> just is kind of looking at me and smiling, and I said, what? And she goes, you were like a little kid in there. And like she had seen me like, I had taken her to hang out in the VIP section of clubs with Vin Diesel and stuff like that. So she'd seen me around celebrities, but she goes, you're like a little kid. So I had my starry eyed moment too. You're right, uh, Dennis. We all got our, our, at least one person that, that gets us. Uh, listen, uh, Ace, wrap it up. Ask your question. Let's send this thing home. This has been fun. Uh, question. This comes actually from my wife, Lucy. Oh, she has a love for a show called Supernatural. And we happened when we were shooting the main event in one of the arenas that was being used. They were shooting, I think, across the lot. And she gave me endless, endless, just endless shit because I didn't try to go over and find Jensen Ackles, for Christ's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a quick story about your your uh, experience on working on Supernatural. I know you've worked on not just the wrestling uh, episode you've worked on maybe you know more oh, than, than episodes, that yeah. yeah exactly uh give us give us a quick supernatural story and then wrap it up please go ahead and put over your book you've written two of them when we were bouncers if you would um i'm gonna try to think of one that doesn't bury jensen because they'll kill me if i do uh actually the first time i worked with jensen uh it wasn't even on uh supernatural it was on a show called dark angel in like 2002 and there was a an underground cage fighting scene and Jensen is this genetically augmented guy who comes in and beats up people three times his size. Uh, but he was like 17, 18 at the time. And I'll never okay. forget his face when he walked in because we were all warming up. And it was, um, you know, it was one guy, Brad Kelly, who was the only non-professional fighter among the guys who were playing fighters. But Brad's built like a, a like Brock Lesnar, a little bit scaled down. Brad's a brute. So Brad's loping around with his knuckles dragging. And, and uh, Dan Rizzuto, who was fighting on... Uh, He's a Ron Baliki guy, and he fought on Frank Shamrock's team. Uh, Lance Gibson, who fought in the UFC, and and uh, and myself. And we're all warming up and kicking pads and stuff. And Jensen just walks in, and his face drops. And then he goes over to, to one of the ADs, like, whispers in their ear, and the, the guy kind of shakes his head. And Jensen walks away, and I said, I went over, what did Jensen say? He goes, he was just asking if we all know that it's fake. <laughs> <laughs> That's we all did the job for him that day, but he's he's a great guy. Jensen and Jared uh, Padalecki both just just awesome dudes. Working on Supernatural was so much freaking fun. Yeah, I, I I'm sad the show's gone because I always loved it when I went out there. Sure, sure. Um, and and I jumped to your books, but I also want to make sure we talk about what you're currently doing with with the uh, the the show with uh, uh. I actually don't. It's just I'm going to say the Superman show because yeah. I, I haven't watched it. I'm a, I'm a yeah, freaking exactly. idiot. <laughs> the current season of Superman and Lois is two episodes from the end of the season now, but uh, I've been playing a neo-Nazi piece of shit supervillain named Adam Man, 
uh, the first costume Superman or the first costume villain that Superman of that show ever fought. And um, so I've got about a seven episode arc, but episode one and episode nine of this season are, are the big episodes for me. And uh, then there is also another character that I'll be playing in the final episode of this season, which uh, I can't reveal right now, but it's really big. Like I'm really stoked that I'll be playing. This awesome. Season. It's awesome. Um, I'm really looking forward to it airing. I think uh, it's going to cause a lot of stir in the fan base. Uh, and yes, with regards to the books, uh, my I'm working on the third volume of a book series I've got called When We Were Bouncers. And When We Were Bouncers is discussions with uh, famous professional wrestlers, actors, stunt performers, comedians, authors, you know, people who are prominent in their fields of entertainment who used to be bouncers telling their best bouncing stories. So uh, I'm working on book number three right now. I got Ric Flair a while ago, thanks to Steve Austin doing me a favor. So I'm looking forward nice. to the launch in that. Um, but uh, I'm, and I'm also uh, we're still in discussions, but there are a couple of platforms that we're talking about developing it into a, uh, an on-screen series. Oh, so excellent! We'll see if we can get to get that going. But uh, in the meantime, yeah, just check out uh, when we were bouncers. It's available on Amazon, Volume One, Volume Two. Uh, and you can also get it from your local bookseller. Just have them order it in. I will put this over as as in it's uh, don't take the connotation terrible. It's a great shooter book because there's oh yeah it's like short there's short stories on there, and you'll get a few, and you'll walk away, and you'll come back, and you always you always have something interesting in there. They're phenomenal. I have them both. Just wanted to put that over. Well, thanks. No, that's exactly what I read it or wrote it as. I, I want people to be able to pick it up. You can almost open it to any spot. And there's just contained yeah. stories in there. You don't have to read it from the beginning to end. Although one of the best endorsements I got was from Steve Austin. And he, he said he's he does have a legitimate ADD and, and it makes it difficult for him to read. And he said that um, when we were bouncers, one was the third book that he had read front to back um, in years. Oh, wow. And that he, he said he actually destroyed it in one sitting. And uh, he, he said when we were bouncers, two was going to be the fourth. And so it probably was. Wow. That's awesome. Where can people find you? Uh, I am on social media on Instagram at Famous Bouncers, reference to the, the books, and on Twitter at Mauler MMA, M A U L E R M M A. Well, listen, Paul, thank you so much for carving out about an hour to talk to us. We barely scratched the surface of everything you've done, but it's been so fun. Uh, a total education for me. Ace, I had a blast. I'll tell everybody, listen, Wrestling Perspective, download, rate, subscribe, do all the <laughs> bullshit you do. Tell your friends. We never ask you for a dime. We keep it advertising free. So the least you can do is go tell fucking somebody, all right? Go call your mom, call your sister, call your brother. <laughs> tell them Ace Still is on the podcast. They'll be like, who the fuck is Ace Still? And then I right. say that all the time. Yeah. 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 You said it. When he emailed you to come on the show, you're like, first of all, who is Ace? And what is and then I went, oh, 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 it's Lucy's husband. I like Lucy. I'll do it. Oh, <laughs> do you understand how it fucking pained me to just put you over for a fucking hour? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> no, thanks a lot. I appreciate this, Paul. It's good. No, good I appreciate chit chat. Yep. Yeah, I appreciate being invited on. Dennis, thanks for having me on your show, man. This has been fun. Absolutely. For everybody at home, the show's over. We're going to say our goodbyes off the air. Wrestling perspective. Paul, thank you. Ace, thank you so much. Good first show. We'll be back again. What you're here for the next month with me? I am. Yeah, court ordered. He lost a, a lawsuit in Illinois, <laughs> and part of the restitution is he has to do community <laughs> service on this podcast. So, unfortunately, for the next month, he has to fulfill that obligation. So, thank you, City of. It's always America. a lawsuit. It's always a lawsuit with Lars. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody.